Let's get this show started. And our first speaker then is Dave Snowden. We are so fantastically proud to have you here. Creator of the Kenevin framework. Welcome up. Thanks. And <laughs> Dave, uh, you're the founder and uh, chief scientific officer at Cognitive Edge, and uh, your work is international in nature and covers government and industry looking at complex issues relating to strategy and organizations drawing out on anthropology, neuroscience, uh, and complex adaptive systems theory. Very popular, passionate speaker. Complex speaker, maybe? No? <laughs> on a range of subjects, and you are well known for your pragmatic cynicism and iconi iconoclastic style, it should be, right? Okay. Take it away. <laughs> um, firstly, apologies, I won't be here tomorrow, but that gives me the great delight of saying, but don't worry, Sonia will explain it in the morning, all right? So you'll We'll see a lot of that coming through, right? Sonia and I have worked together for about 15 years, and I picked the dog theme deliberately, but we'll come back to that one. Right? Um, second thing is, I'm going to be around for, there's a panel session, I think, this afternoon. I'll be around on the Agile 42 stand this afternoon, but I won't be here this evening. Um, I've got to go on to another event tomorrow, so apologies for that, but I'll make myself as available as I can. Um, what I want to do is to start off by talking a little bit about where Agile is at the moment. Um, a lot of us are really concerned that what's as Agile starts to move out of the IT development space into HR and marketing is taking the worst aspects of the last 10 years rather than the original inspiration. All right? And I'll talk a bit about that um, as we go through that. And then I want to go on to what for me is key, um, which is basically taking a natural science-based approach to social systems. That's what I've worked on for the past 15 or 20 years, and I'll explain the basis of that. And I'm going to look at a few things. I'm going to look at the role of failure in human cognition. I'm going to look at cognitive bias. And I'm going to look at complexity. And I'll wrap that up. So that's the idea, to do some positioning. Right? I want to start off with this. That, that's, a, that's a wolf. It's a gray wolf. Yeah? Anybody who grew up in the Jungle Book will recognize the gray wolf. And we'll finish up with just so stories. So I'm getting symmetry um, around Kipling here. Right? Um, if you actually look at the canine species in the wild, there are about five or six types. There, there's very little variation. Yeah? Um, they're highly resilient. If you look at what happens with domestication, within seven generations yeah, of selective breeding, we get that sort of nonsense. All right? <laughs> it's highly unresilient. We get individual species which require major care just to allow them to breathe properly. All right? And my father was a veterinary surgeon, and he had to put a lot of these down, but he really felt that the breeders and owners should have been executed first, all right? Uh, some of my attitudes come from my father in that respect, all right? The problem with domestication is it destroys a lot of the resilience in the gene pool, um, because it produces a high level of specialization, and that's where Agile is at the moment. I mean, I'm still trying to understand the debates between Scrum and Kanban, because both of them make the fundamental error of thinking it's all about clearing cards pinned to a wall rather than delivering value, all right? And how you can see any difference between the two, I just don't understand. Right? Um, just giving you a flavor how this is going to go on, right? <laughs> um, so let's look at some of the issues, all right? So this is a cartoon from Gaping Void. I'll talk a bit about Gaping Void later. Uh, we just completed a major project with them to identify 49 archetypal cartoons about agile culture. Uh, which we're about to use in Agile readiness surveys, but I'll talk about that at the end. This is, actually came out this morning, last night, yeah? so it was highly appropriate. Um, and I don't buy the natural law thing, but I've taken law to science. All right? um, basically, the problem we got is we do know things about nature which are true. We know things about cognition. But most of the time, what we do is socially construct meaning around what we want to believe. Yeah? And that's a real problem. And it's impacted Agile in a major way. So let's look at a couple of these. First of all, if you look at the original adoption of Agile, if you go back to the Agile manifesto, um, XP dominates the meeting in Snowbird far more than Scrum. In fact, Scrum is an afterthought. But the thing which drives Agile to scalability, and this is good and bad, all right? Agile would never have grown if it had stayed with XP. Um, XP people are brilliant, but they can't talk to ordinary human beings. Therefore, there's, there's a problem on scaling. Right? 
So when Ken puts it together as a scrum, it suddenly it's got structure. You know, we've got two week sprints, we've got project roles. All of a sudden, we can now scale because people, people can see something precise. The trouble is that then becomes doctrine. Yeah, and we get into another set of problems that go with that. I say Scrum was really important. Without that, Agile would not have taken off, and it's still highly useful. But we get the certification scams. The idea that you can call yourself a master of anything, having done a two-day course and filled out a multi-choice questionnaire in an open book exam over the following eight weeks with, adult, with other adults present, is a travesty. Yeah? Um, the pyramid Planning scheme, which got safe started, do my four-day course and pay me a fee, and you can deliver the three-day course, provided you pay me another fee. Um, these are actually a disgrace to the actual original principles of Agile, and we're still carrying on with it. I'm now seeing people certifying people as HR coaches in Agile on the basis of a two- or two, three-day course. The pattern is continuing. Yeah? Nothing wrong with structure to get things started. Everything wrong with structure when you make it an ideological imposition yeah, and you start to create certification. Uh, we're actually launching our own certification program, he says, not with hypocrisy, but it's actually a three-year process in which your participation in Wiki and your colleagues' opinions of whether you contributed or not are part of the certification. Yeah? You can't grant somebody competence in less than two to three years. So, a bit of cognitive neuroscience number one. In Australia, they don't let kids drive cars with other than elderly relatives for the first two years after they pass their test. And there's a good reason for this. It takes two to three years for the brain and the body to co-evolve to the point where you can drive without paying attention. It's actually a very good safety move. The same is true of coding. Coding is not just something you do in your brain, it's something you do in your fingers. It takes you two or three years before you really acquire skills to the point where you can use them in a masterly or professional way. Yeah? So I'm throwing that one out because we need to start to think about this, and a certification scan is a major problem. More money is made out of training and certification in Agile than is made out of producing quality code for users. Yeah, that's kind of like the emphasis. Next one. We've got too many recipe book users and not enough chefs. Yeah, there's not, nothing wrong with recipe books. You know, they're how you get started, but if you haven't got the right ingredients and you haven't got the right equipment, you're lost. A chef can produce a wonderful meal with whatever they happen to find in your kitchen. Yeah? And we're developing a factor. I mean, I've seen this, for example, last time I looked at the SAFE certification, you basically have people reading text with slides and say in their training. We just completed our latest train the trainer. We don't train people in any of our slides. We train them in the principles which underpin the slides. Because a trainer should know far more than the material they're giving to the users. You need to go deeper in that sense. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Starting at the end of someone else's journey. Uh, if I hear one more person say they're adopting the Spotify model, <laughs> then I feel that not only have they got the same design features as the VASA, but they deserve the same end. Right? <laughs> the reality is that you can't copy the end point of a journey, Spotify themselves said. Yeah? Yeah, individual companies have different journeys. Companies actually often do innovative stuff on self-organization because they're starting from scratch. It doesn't mean you can replicate what they did in a company which is mature in a different way. Yeah, we need to start to look at underlying principles rather than following recipes, that same point again. But basically, starting journeys allows you to discover novelty and adapt to context. Copying what somebody else did over a 15-year process based on what they think they remember they did is actually rather dubious. Yeah? Confusing correlation with causation. I went past the Nobel Prize, win Nobel Prize Museum yesterday. Um, if Sweden wants to in increase the number of Nobel Prizes it wins, all it has to do is increase the amount of dark chocolate consumed. If you don't know it, dark chocolate consumption for head of population directly correlates with Nobel Prizes per head of population over the last 20 years, right? So there's an obvious causal impact, isn't there? Go eat more chocolate. <laughs> if you don't know it, drownings by suicide coincide in their peaks with the release of Nicolas Cage movies. <laughs> but I can see a causal connection there, right? 99 percent of all known management books confuse correlation with causation. They grab five or six cases, they believe what people tell them about those cases, 
And from that, they create a recipe and say, do this, it will follow. It's a confusion of correlation with causation. Yeah? If you look at the two worst books in the Agile movement, uh, one is Lean Startup. Anybody read that one? Yeah, it goes and studies friends of his who succeeded and believes what they tell them and writes a recipe book based on that. He doesn't bother to study the people who failed. If he actually did, he'd discover what we discovered in IBM with Dorothy Leonard of Harvard Business School. All the companies who fail do exactly the same things as the companies who succeed. There is no difference. The point is you've got a market. There are so many players, some are bound to succeed. But of course, it's sold and peddled as a recipe, do this, you will be successful. I could equally say, because there are more failures than successes, do this and you're doomed to fail. The other one is LaCroix's book, Reinventing the Organization. Anybody read that bunch of twaddle? <laughs> okay, that's what we actually call, yeah, an ideology seeking cases to justify itself. One of its main cases, Zappos, has only succeeded in imposing a so-called self-organizing system by a draconian CEO imposing it and firing Does that sound like that follows? does is he's got an ideological position and he finds aspects of cases which back that ideological position. He doesn't even investigate his cases properly, but people want to believe it, therefore they listen. The chairman started off by introducing the political crisis we're in worldwide at the moment. People are listening to what they want to believe, not investigating. But I'm sorry to say this, the liberal elite in the agile community are as guilty. Yeah, in that respect, it's a human tendency, and we need to get more disciplined about this. Yeah. And the final, and I've, there's a deference there to Agile 42, by the way. Yeah, it, it is actually mostly harmless, and if you don't realise that's an insult, you haven't read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy properly. Yeah. Okay. So this is the natural science concept. So let's start to hit them. First, I use this a lot of conference because it makes the point. Radiologists actually have four or five years of training, and unlike two to three day courses. They on average have 10 to 15 years experience of actually reading and looking at x-rays rather than coaching other people to do things rather than doing it themselves. So this is a highly disciplined profession. You give them a batch of x-rays and I'll ask them to look for anomalies. On the final x-ray you put a picture of a gorilla which is 48 times the size of an average cancer nodule. 83% don't see it even though their eyes physically scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talked to the 83% who did. This is called inattentional blindness. We do not see what we do not expect to see. And the only people who are exempt from this are people who are fully autistic, and of course they can't operate. The reality is there's a spectrum between at the one end full autism where you see everything, therefore you're overwhelmed, yeah, and a lot of IT people, are, uh, IT people are towards that end of the spectrum. They like structured material. At the other end, you've got what uh, Lacan called a uh, pervert zuissance, yeah? the like of Trump, where everything that happens has to fit his perspective on himself. Yeah, either filtering is now so extreme, it doesn't permit a variation. Now, all of us, this is Andy Clark's work, sit somewhere on that spectrum, and we move around in different contexts. In a way, we're all mentally ill under the conventional definition. Yeah, because we have a filtering mechanism. You only take into account about 5% of what's available to you. That's the most you scan if you're really focused. 10% yeah, if you're Chinese, there are different cognitive developments based around language types. But for most people here, it's 5%. But most of the time, it's 2 or 3%. You then match that partial data scan against patterns stored in your brain, your body, your social interactions, and your tools. Uh, consciousness is a function of all of those. It's not just the brain. And you do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. Yeah, so you ace in a partial data scan, you use the first pattern which fits. And in evolutionary terms, you can see why this happens. Think about the first hominoids on the savannas of Africa. Something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and then reference having identified a lion, reference your certification program notes on how to avoid lions. Right? By that time, the only document of any use to you will be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, 
which is the only example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a survivor. Yeah? We evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan privilege in our most recent experiences. That's how you all make decisions. So anybody who thinks they're a professional systems analyst is severely deluded. You will actually only hear the things that match your expectations when you go into the meeting. If you conduct more than two interviews, your brain forms a subconscious hypothesis, and you literally only hear things that match that hypothesis thereafter. You see why we have problems? Collectively, we're actually very good. Yeah, if you have cognitive, by behavioral, and neurological diversity within a team, and you prepare to listen to it, we're extremely effective as a species. But the focus on the individual and individual change is bad biology as well as bad sociology in terms of the way we work. Now, I say there are implications for this, and you can work on that image. Yeah? Uh, most of Agile is actually a sheep in wool's clothing, right? Uh, rather than the other way around. Think about that one, it's a good one. Right? So there's some clear implications here. First of all, we don't see what we don't expect to see, right? The solution to that is you want multiple sensors working independently of each other and look for patterns in that sensor feedback mechanism. I'll give you some examples of this later. We're now using the whole of a workforce to assess business situations in real time in a non-gameable way so we can find the 17% of employees who've seen a gorilla where everybody else is ignoring it. Yeah, so once you get the science, you can institute the practice. If you just try and derive the science from the practice, with a very limited data set you've got, you never get anywhere. I should declare a prejudice here, by the way. My first degree is physics and philosophy as a joint major, which meant I was trained to have a contempt for social science from two completely different disciplines. And to be honest, experience hasn't shaken off any of that contempt. All right? No social scientist ever has enough data to make any reasonable conclusion. Yeah? Doesn't mean we can't learn from it, but we can't draw causal links. So that's key. Secondly, we need to start to realize that hindsight is not the same thing as foresight. Have you noticed whenever anybody looked backwards after a, nat after a natural disaster or a major company failure, everybody can see why, why it happened, but they carry on getting it wrong the next time. Economists are particularly prone to this. The idea that economy is a science, I find one of the most hysterical propositions of the modern age. Right? Fundamentally, we actually reinterpret the past to meet the political needs of the present. That's what all human beings do. So if a team has succeeded, and we actually did experiments on this in IBM, we did lessons learned the day after a team knew whether they'd won an outsourcing contract or not, and we did the same process the day before they knew, and we compared the results. Completely different histories. The history before people knew the outcome was rich and contingent. The history, if they succeeded, was narrow based on their own brilliance and their own logical processes. And if they failed, it was somebody else's fault. All of them were well-intentioned, identical process. The way we remember things is based on the context in which we're asked to remember them. Now, there's another implication I haven't got on the slide by way here. If you want to capture lessons learned, you capture it as people do things. You never do it in a workshop after the event. Yeah, moving to real-time retrospectives is probably more important than instituting the perspective of retrospectives. Yeah, because with even 24 hours, we'll actually change the way we know things. Next one. Ritual works better than rules to change human behavior because it changes the patterns that are available to you. I'll give you a safety example, famous one, first time we did this. New Zealand lorry drivers were having a massive amount of accidents in the first 10 minutes after they arrived at a key to unload their lorry. The reason is their entrained pattern was lorry driver. If you've driven for 200 miles, you're thinking like a driver. It takes 10 or 15 minutes for the brain and the body to reset to think like an unloader. So what we did was to give them heated belts. You can't unload the lorry till you strap on this heated weightlifter's belt. It's a ritual, it's a physical act that triggered a switch of the patterns and we actually reduced the accidents to about 15% of what they had before. We didn't write rules or put up motivational posters. We basically did a ritual to change the perspective. 
Think about what happens. I had to put on a dinner jacket in an Agile conference in Lisbon recently. Oh, this is a unique occurrence, having to wear a dinner jacket in an Agile conference. I felt radically different after I put the bow tie on than before. Changing your dress changes the way you think. Start to think about this for those of you in DevOps. Start to think about the different cognitive style you need to test code as opposed to develop it. And start to realize you need some ritual transformation between the team so you're using a different part of your brain and body to actually scan the data. Ritual is one of the most important things along with habits. And then the other thing, a model I created some time ago is called See, Attend, Act. Most management theory, and HR people are particularly prone to this, believes if you have the right people with the right competences, the right training in the right context with the right information, they will make the right decisions. If that doesn't work, they blame culture or go on a leadership course. Right? The reality is how we see the data, whether we pay attention to the data, whether we will act on the data, are three completely different processes. You can't assume if people have the right information, they will pay attention to it. And even if they can pay attention to it, they may not act on it. Now, to give an example, we were working in um, DC around 9-11. And one of the big things we had to do after 9-11 is to go through complexity-based ex exercise um, with the former White House um, Al-Qaeda team. Yeah? Now, there were some fascinating things on that. But one of the questions I asked, because if you don't know, there was a congressional order which would have been signed by Gore if he hadn't been displaced by a judicial coup, right? Sorry, I'm political on this one. Um, we should have had F-14s in permanent patrol above Washington and New York with authority to actually shoot down civilian aircraft. Yeah, the Clinton White House had worked out Al-Qaeda's strategy. That was kind of like if abandoned by the Bush White House. It was considered Democrat pioneer about Al-Qaeda. Now, I remember asking the question of Gore, and said, would you have actually signed that order? And he thought about it, and he said, probably not. Because the context of 9-11 means shooting down hijacked civilian aircraft is, is acceptable. The context before 9-11, in the mistakes in the Middle East and the Korean airliner, is actually you couldn't do it. Now, understanding that difference is key. There are some things executives want to do, but the context doesn't allow them to do it, even if they think it's right. Yeah, context is everything. And you need to separate what we see, what we attend, and what we act in terms of the way you build processes. Yeah, and again, ritual can help on that. Perspective can. Next major factor. How many people have got children? OK, how many people read them bedtime stories? All right, does your bedtime story start off with um, Janet and John stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, got their childhood certification, attendance certificates, and achieve the family's velocity ratio. Anybody do that one? <laughs> or do you do, Janet and John went into the wild woods, encountered evil wolves, witches, goblins, sprites, trolls, etc. Of course, we have a happy ending because we want them to sleep at night. But the reality is we tell stories of failure. What stories practice around a workshop? Stories of failure, around a, a water cooler. What stories do the press pick up? Stories of failure. Yeah? Trying to tell people not to do this challenges 100,000 years of evolutionary history, which says avoidance of failure is a more successful strategy than imitation of success. Yeah. Sorry, I've gone too far on that. Yeah. Basically, avoidance of failure is a more successful strategy than imitation of success. We actually build worse practice systems for companies. If I go on the safety work, all right, the story of how you know, Bill fought, got to strap his harness onto the, the um, gantry, as a result of which he fell off the gantry. And if he hadn't fallen on his friend and broken his friend's leg, he wouldn't have survived. Everybody knows that story. Nobody knows the story about the person who clipped on his safety harness and was safe, because that's boring. Teaching stories tend to be stories of survived failure not stories of success. Yeah, one of the ways you actually create organization director is not to say what you want to be, but to say what you don't want to be. If you want a self-organizing system, you have to have constraints. Constraints which identify negative patterns but allow freedom to deflow the positive are much better than ones that create platitudes as a positive outcome. Yeah, negative stories are more valuable. They provide more learning. I say there's some implications for that. One is the one I've just said. 
Second, yeah, worst practice, not best practice. Then another interesting thing, if you don't know it, cave painting and music come before language in human evolution. It's unique to humans out of all the mammals. Yeah? As a result of which, our languages are not limited by Dunbar's numbers to a limited vocabulary, because our language evolved from abstractions. Now, it turns out that's key to invention. That's why it survives and develops. If you move up a level of abstraction, you start to make connections between things in novel and exciting ways. If you stay in the concrete, you never make those connections. Now, now start to think about that, because actually a focus on STEM education potentially damages a nation's ability to be inventive. Yet yeah, art has evolved in human beings for a very good reason. It makes us tremendously resilient and adaptive, and we need to work with it. Yeah, and again, we can start to look at that. I'll talk later about the work we do on high abstraction signifier sets. Finally, failure games. So the most effective work we've done in military decision making is set up games in which everybody fails. And no matter what they do, they carry on failing. And as they fail, we gather the stories about their failure and what they've learned from it. And that becomes a living database to deal with current reality. So actually, we do scenario planning and contingency planning as part of the training. Putting leaders through a series of failure games, it's called anthro simulation. At the end of it, they're scanning 30 to 40 to more times data yeah, when they make a decision than they are at the start. If they succeed, they scan less data. If they fail, they scan more. So training people to succeed will reduce their cognitive capability. Putting people in situations where they consistently fail will increase their cognitive capability, uh, which is, by the way, the basis of apprentice models and everything else. Now, all of this is actually common sense, but we've forgotten about it. And that leads me on to complexity. I like this image because, kind of like, you know there's some sort of coherence in that web of fishing tackle, but you can't work it out. And if you try and it apart, it gets worse. Everybody's been undisciplined people who don't know how to properly coil cables, all right? I mean, it should be taken out and garroted. The trouble is the cables are so broken by the way they've restored them that they break in the act of grotting, so you couldn't do it. Sorry, there's a personal one in this one, right? Basically, when things get entangled, they're difficult to separate, but it doesn't mean there isn't coherence. Yeah? Complexity is about systems where you have deep entanglement between multiple factors. There are no clear pathways between cause and effect. Yeah? If you pull one of those ropes, every time you pull it, the, the entanglement has changed. So each pull will produce a different effect. There's no stability within the system. Yeah, and the most human systems are complex adaptive systems. They have multiple interacting causal factors. They all work in radically different ways. I'll go on to this in a minute, but just hold that. The key thing to understand about a complex adaptive system is it's not causal. There is no linear relationship between cause and effect. It's dispositional. I can only ever say there is a probability that this thing will happen, or there's a probability that this thing won't happen, but I can never say, if you do this, it will have that, that result. Yeah, now, that again, undermines a huge amount of agile practice. Yeah? Doesn't mean it's not valid, but it undermines it in many ways. So again, implications, retrospective coherence. Here's the classic case on this, right? If I have four dots, You've all heard the phrase, why didn't we join at the dots? Everybody heard that? OK, four dots, one, two, three, four, five, six linkages. Four dots, six linkages, 64 possible patterns. If I go up to 10 dots, how many patterns do you think there are? Guesses, please. I don't want a form, I want a number. 1,024. How many people think that's too low, too high? Okay, it's too low. Anybody want to go with another one? No? A million. Okay, how many people think a million's too low? Too high? It's too low, you're getting the pattern, yeah? It's actually greater than 3.4 trillion. If I go up to 12, it's greater than 4.8 quadrillion. If you know your ancient stories, it's the emperor's chessboard. A sage asks for a reward by the emperor. Said, I have one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard and double thereafter. There isn't enough rice in China. How many dots are there in the human system? How many possible patterns are there? 
Are you ever going to believe any book based on cases ever again? <laughs> yeah, not only have you got inattentional blindness, but you've got people joining up the dots. After the event, anybody can join up the dots, but it doesn't give you the ability to do it again in the future. I like the rear view mirror image there. Next one. Yeah, I talked about that one. The other key thing, and this comes into the original Agile Manifesto, I don't think they were aware of complexity theory, you know that interactions are more than things. How things interact is far more important than what they are. Now that actually has major implications for HR practice. HR practice constantly focuses on changing individuals, which is ethically dubious and biologically inefficient. Yeah, which one you think is more important, I'll leave to your conscious, but both of them undermine it. Right? The reality is by changing social interactions, you can change people far faster than by trying to change the people. Yeah, linkages are far more important than people, and, com and the idea of competences, by the way, is really bad cognitive science. Yeah? There are no such things as innate competences. And if any anybody done Myers-Briggs? Okay, I scientifically proved in IBM that astrology was more accurate than Myers-Briggs in predicting team behavior <laughs> over a six-month experiment. They didn't quite forgive me for that one. But astrology at least has several thousand years of deceiving people behind it, where it's only 100 years old with Myers-Briggs, right? Yeah. Okay, so I hold that one because this has major implications, all right? We tend to, you know, look at agile people. They say people haven't got the agile mindset. That's nonsense. People are not linking and connecting in a way which will lead to agile behaviors. Trying to change people's mindset is ethically dubious and biologically ineffective, to come back to that phrase. Yeah? If you change these linkages and interactions, people change with that. Now, that's probably one of the biggest things I'm going to tell you today, one of the most important things that we know. Okay. So. Let's briefly do with Kinevin. I haven't got long on this, but I just want to draw it quickly, all right? I'm going to do this because there's a lot of people using Kinevin in Agile at the moment. You've got Codefin, you've got Liz Keo. But I just want to draw something to make a point, all right? Um, that, by the way, is, if you don't know it, uh, that's a picture on the top of Glidavour in Wales in Mist, all right? Try and navigate off that without a compass and you're in trouble, all right? So there's a metaphor in there. Yeah? So basically, Kinevin as a framework looks like this. Just draw it in purple. Now remember I said we have a world which is complex. That's a world with many intertwining causes and effects. It's constantly entangled. Everything you do changes the system. Now one of the things about a complex space is you have massive conflict. Because lots of people have got good ideas about what you should do. But you can't resolve who's right on an evidence base because there isn't sufficient evidence. The way you approach this, and this is a major thing we do on Peace and Reconciliation, is you don't test for whether somebody's likely to be right. You test for whether their hypothesis is coherent or not. Because to agree that your hypothesis is coherent doesn't involve me in agreeing that you're right. So I radically reduce that pressure up front. Instead of having to select between eight ideas because you've only got money for one, you give a small amount of money to any of the ideas which proves it's coherent. And you run them effectively as what are called safe to fail experiments. You probe, you sense, respond. Child people keep getting wrong. They think this means you do one iteration. You don't. You do multiple experiments in parallel. But if you do one experiment, you'll suffer Hawthorne effect, if you don't know that. Anything novel always works the first time, because human beings respond to it, but it won't scale. Yeah, so you do small experiments in parallel, which actually means practice is what's called exaptive. Exaptive is a biological phrase, so a dinosaur's feathers evolve for sexual display but then when dinosaurs start to fall off cliffs by accident, they evolve into feathers for flight. Yeah, you can't get flight immediately because if dinosaurs jumped off cliffs in the hope of developing feathers before they hit the ground, they probably wouldn't get a chance to breed or, on, or only in sort of some sort of broken limbed agony. Right? Um, the basic fact is that it's called radical repurposing. It's like magnetos on microwave ovens were repurposed for, sorry, magnetos on radar machines were repurposed for microwave ovens 
when somebody noticed that a chocolate bar melted in their pocket. Yeah? Exaptive learning is rapid repurposing of existing capability for something which is novel. And there's ways to design for that. IBM dominated the computer industry for 50 years because they repurposed punch card machines in which they were experts to actually create an operating system and we still haven't got away from that with things like Windows, right? In terms of the way it works. So that's fine, that's com complex. We then get two types of order. One's where the relationship between cause and effect is obvious, which means effectively we've got rigid constraints and what we actually do is we sense, categorize, respond. I'm in Sweden, you drive on the right, I drive on the right. I'm in the UK, we drive on the left, you drive on the left. It's self-evident, everybody, you do it. Yeah? That's the range of best practice. Yeah? It's a valuable space. Complicated is actually where I have to analyze sense respond because I don't actually know what's going on. Yeah? It's not self-evident. You know, At both of these domains is there is a right thing to do and you can discover it and here we have good practice not best practice. And then we get chaos which is a state of no constraint so I act sense respond and practice is completely novel. We also have this which is called the domain of disorder which is a domain where you don't know which domain you're in which is where most people start so actually you've only got a one in four chance of getting it right. Yes, that's a bad place to be. The, the revolutionary idea behind Kinevin, by the way, is you use different methods in different contexts, and the methods may actually contradict each other. A method which works for complex may be a disaster in complicated and vice versa. Yeah. Now, I've done that quickly, because the real point I wanted to make here was the introduction lately of the liminal domains of Kinevin, which look like this, which effectively are transition devices. This one here, the liminal zone into chaos is where you deliberately remove all constraints so that novelty can emerge. And that's very expensive. Chaos is only ever a temporary space. If anybody presents Kinevin and puts things like traffic in it, they don't understand the framework. Yeah, chaos is temporary. The absence of constraints is difficult to maintain. If you can maintain it, you get complete novelty. It's rather like nuclear fission. You know, the, the, the energy for the magnetic fields to contain the plasma is actually more than the energy you get out of it. So you've got to be careful about that. This one here is the most important one for Agile. So this is where I've done my parallel safe to fail experiments. And now I'm pretty sure this is the right direction, but I need to get it right. So I'm going to go a series of iterations to check my assumptions. That's called Scrum. Scrum's great strength is it's a liminal technique. The trouble is you need things you do before Scrum to decide what goes into it. Uh, and that's been one of the big problems with Agile. And I'll just list three and I will, Sonia will go through these tomorrow for anybody interested. Yeah, Sorry Sonia, this is the first of many. Right? One is what we call trios. That's where you actually put a pair programming team together with a user trained to talk to IT people. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than train IT people to understand users. We're repurposing, oh, your child is autistic, how do you handle it, training material, right? It's, it's quite easy, really. Right? Um, basically, you send 15 or 16 trios to look at a problem and see what comes back. That costs you significantly less than an analyst interviewing people and it introduces cognitive diversity into the system. We're doing this with universities, engineering, humanities, and pure sciences. When you join the university, you have to form a trio with the other two faculties. And you have jobs to do every term, which you get rewards for, but we're building a network which is transdisciplinary. Yeah, indirectly, and that's another key principle. What we call triple eight. That's where you put a rapid design team on a process for eight hours, then you throw the output over to another team on an eight hour time difference, and they throw it onto another team on an eight hour time difference, and teams two and three are not allowed access to the original user need deliberately forcing mutation. Every time we do it, it comes back, the users say, God, I wouldn't have thought of that, can I please have it? You see what we're doing here? And the other big one is unarticulated need mapping, 
where you capture people's day-to-day -day experiences and when they cluster significantly, I'll show you a cluster map in a minute, then you put a prototype team on it, you never go and ask people what they want. Now, I'll just make this point, and as I say, Sonia will go into this more tomorrow. One of the big issues we got at the moment is technology is capable of doing things that users don't know what to ask for. And technology experts have a narrow focus on what they think their technology is about. They don't realize how it could be repurposed. So any process which is based on a request followed by completion of the request, the basis of all agile techniques, misses 83% of the available data yeah, in terms of the way it works at least. Right? So what I'm arguing for here is pre-scrum pre techniques, and that applies to HR and elsewhere. So I wanted to introduce Kenevin just to get that point across, yeah? that the transitions between the domains are more important domains, and we need a multi-methods approach. Anybody who argues you do Kanban, you do Scrum, you do this, you do that, is basically taking what's called a mono-ontological approach. They're assuming one type of system, and therefore they're bound to get things wrong when they apply that technique in another system. A multi-methods approach doesn't mean that everything is equally valid. I think that's, if you look at agnostic agile, make this mistake as well. Some things are plainly wrong, and some things are right in one context and wrong in another context. Yeah, and we need to understand that in terms of the way it works. So, moving on and starting to reach to a conclusion. Other things that you do. Mapping constraints is one of the most important things. Complex systems are defined by the constraints in play. Because you only ever make decisions based on how you've already decided to act, you all know that one? Okay, all human beings, when they assess a situation, have already subconsciously decided what to do, so they only see the things in that situation which justify their feeling. Now, getting them to sit around in circles in Kumbaya Agile sessions, saying we'll be open to people's other ideas, may be emotionally satisfying for facilitators who desperately need workshops to satisfy their emotional needs, but it doesn't make any difference, right? Yeah, the reality is, in a workshop, anybody will say anything, but reality changes matters. Yeah, you just can't do it that way. You know, deal with reality rather than anything else. The whole point here is that we need to assess a situation in such a way that people aren't thinking about the action, using the science. So what we do, I guess one of the things Sonia will teach tomorrow, is constraint mapping. You don't talk about what we want, you map the constraints. And there's a whole typology of constraints. And you say, if I change that constraint, might it produce a good result? And you do a safe-to-fail experiment. Yeah? And only when you start to see a pattern emerging do you go into a conventional process. And here are some aspects of the typology. Constraints can contain or they can connect. They can be resilient or they can be robust. Think about a seawall. Yeah, I, I don't use this in the Netherlands at the moment because it's a source of impending national grief. Right? I mean, seawalls are wonderful things. You can drain the land on one side. And the trouble is when the water rises to a certain level or the storm reaches a certain ferocity, the wall will break. And it would be better if, the, if you'd never had it in the first place. Yeah, on the other hand, a salt marsh absorbs a huge amount of water it's not very efficient because you can't farm the land, but it carries on holding that water even when it's saturated. And that's resilience. So you might, for example, say this fixed constraint, let's make it semi-permeable and see what happens. You see where we go with constraint mapping? It's actually, you can do a lot of this on UX and system design as well. And finally, scaffolding or permanent. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Mapping dispositional states, and I'm giving you these are kind of like the one, two, three things we now do. First of all, map the constraints. Start talking about where you want to be, your idealistic goals. Map the constraints and ask yourself three questions. Which of these can I change? Out of the ones that I can change, where can I monitor the impact of change? And out of the ones where I can monitor the impact, where by failure would it teach me something and I could recover, or by success I could amplify it quickly? That makes life very simple, but not simplistic. And that's a very important distinction in English, all right? Being simple, but not being simplistic. Yeah, talking about values that individual members of a team should have is being simplistic and idealistic. Yeah, our values are a consequence of our interactions. They don't determine our interactions. The causal chain goes the other way around. How we behave determines what we are, 
It's not what we are determines how we behave. And we're deeply contextual in terms of the way we work. Yeah. So this is in a dispositional map. This is done by getting a huge amount of narrative or observational material in, self-interpreted at the point of origin into what's called a high abstraction metadata structure. Uh, these are structures that you can't game because you don't know what the right answer is. Remember the abstraction point? We shift people up. Sometimes we'll use drawings yeah, rather than words. Now, this is actually a safety case, which I use a lot because it illustrates the point. Um, this dimension here, sorry, change the color, is rule compliance. This dimension here is job completion. Now, this is a real case. This is civil manufacture. This is military manufacture. Now, you can immediately see the problem on the left. You see a dispositional map. I'm not implying cause and effect. I'm showing a dispositional state. This basically shows there are two dominant patterns here, comply with the rules or get the job done, and they're mutually incompatible states. Now, this is actually more common than you think. The right-hand one looks better because you've got that top coaster. People are following the rules and getting the job done. But when you click on that and look at the underlying narrative, you discover it's nuclear weapons testing. Well, nuclear weapons testing creates an existential quality to following the rules and getting the job done, which you can't replicate elsewhere in the business. Yeah? We've then got get the job done, yeah. ignore the rules, and we've got this one, which is actually really bad, I've given up. This, by the way, is the pattern we're seeing among nursing staff in hospitals. In a crisis, they're brilliant. On a day-to-day -day basis, the measurement regime means they have to break the rules to provide empathetic care. But increasingly, doing what they do to survive. Yeah. Now, the way we change this is not to create a wonderful picture which says, wouldn't it be wonderful if we were all up here? Let's have a workshop and all agree that we'll all end up there and we'll put a value statement up on the board composed of the usual platitudes. All right? There's only so many ways you can actually express values, all right? and they're all platitudes. What you actually do is to say, this is a stepping stone. It's called an adjacent possible. So what you now do is you click on that and you say, what can I do tomorrow to create more stories like this and fewer stories like those? And that is the new theory of change. I don't talk about what sort of person you should be. I say, what do we do tomorrow to create more stories like this, fewer stories like that? We do that with 360 feedback on teams. Don't get your customers to score you on a Likert scale because they'll game it. You gather the stories they tell about you in a statistical way, and you say, what can we as a team do to create more user stories like this and fewer user stories like that? You want to engage human beings, you engage them in changing narrative, not in achieving goals. Yeah? And if you look at that, we're also able from that to go on and identify outliers. If we look at this map here, these people are far more significant than these people. I know about this because it's a dominant pattern. Remember the x-ray? That's the 17% who are seeing a gorilla but everybody else isn't listening to them. So that's where we present infographics about a current problem. We fire out to all employees. Within half an hour, they respond, and we draw the maps. So you can find the people who are thinking differently before they become conformed to the rest. Now, again, I'm trying to give you some practical tools to finish up on, but that's kind of like the point. So three things which come from that, and this will conclude. First of all, Vectors, remember that I said more like this, fewer like that? Measuring direction and speed of travel from the present is more valuable than measuring goal achievement. And if you don't believe me, look at that quote. That's from a meta study of all studies of human motivation, where people are working for extrinsic goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. Nothing wrong with extrinsic motivation in some contexts. Everything wrong with it in others. In complex systems, granularity matters. You can't, com you can't scale a complex system by imitation of what worked last time or aggregation into bigger and bigger structures like SAFE. You scale a complex system the way biology scales by decomposition and recombination into new forms. Yeah, so actually getting your unit of analysis is key on that. And with that, we have the scaffolding concept. 
These are five different types of scaffolding. That's a sort of building type scaffolding and bamboo with raffia is more resilient than steel. That's a sort of scaffolding which is the whole training infrastructure, a kayaker, yeah, they're scaffolding in safety by 10 years of experience, training and development of equipment. The scaffolding is built in to the surrounding process. On the top right, you've got a nanostructure. That's where actually a fabric is put in the heart, which decays away and leaves microelectronic traces in the heart, which will sustain the heart in an organic way. That one is a nanostructure for burn victims. We put a, a gauze over your skin, a nutrient gauze. The skin regrows around the scaffolding, and basically the nutrient dies in the process. Yeah. And finally, the bottom right one, that's a keystone. Until the keystone is in place, the structure isn't stable. But once the keystone is there, all the other structures are. Stop trying to design organizations and choose scaffolding and put scaffolding in place and see what grows around the scaffolding. That's actually the big new theme in organizational change. As you start with a loose scaffolding and see what happens, you don't start with an endpoint design. And some cat pictures to finish, right? These are the latest additions to the Snowden household, right? They're called Lyra and Alice. They dominate the space. My wife has bought them several brilliant designer-based beds. Unfortunately, my leather satchel is preferred. So I now surrendered the leather satchel to the cats, right? because they won't be there. You can design anything you want, yeah? but the reality will catch up with you. And those are examples of the stuff we're now doing. You first of all pulse the system, and you take the pulse to see what the dispositional state is. Yeah? Then you sense the patterns in it, and then you nurture change. You don't design change. It's actually a big difference. And so to finish, as I started with Kipling, this is my favorite story in Kipling. It's the cat who walked by himself and all places were alike unto him. And it's a story of domestication. The cow, yeah, um, the dog and the horse surrender to man. The cat is prepared to look after the baby, provided it doesn't pull its tail, and generally be a nice cat, but ultimately it's still a wild creature. Yeah? And remember, species variation in cats is quite limited compared with dogs. Yeah? You need to contain a wild side if you want agility, not agile. And the switch from, to agility from being agile is probably one of the most important things we can achieve. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much for your time.